Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I hope you are doing really well. In today's video, I want to share with you strategies that I have found to be the most successful when teaching challenging classes. Now, if you have missed my other video in which I shared with you the things that I have learned to accept when teaching these difficult classes, then I'll make sure to link it up in the cards above. And if you are new here, hi, hello, my name is Sophia. I'm a science teacher and a head of department in a large secondary school in London. And I run this little community page here on YouTube just to share my teaching experience and advice. And so if you do find it useful, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. So it goes without saying that teaching any type of class or any type of student must come with some thought, preparation and adequate planning. But I think there has to be some particular type of nuance or strategy when it comes to teaching particular classes where there are higher profile students or students that have particular needs that need to be met. And so provide a, an additional aspect of challenge in which it's going to potentially be more time consuming for you and obviously very, very rewarding. So I think the first strategy that I would love to share with you is that you have to really reflect think and refine about the things that you simply will not tolerate. You will likely have to tolerate a lot more when you're teaching a class that has difficult students just from the nature of some of the behaviours that you will encounter. But I think it's really, really important that you potentially brainstorm some of the things that you're finding are happening on a day to day basis in these lessons and really identify what are the things that are incredibly important to you that they don't happen at all. And so these can be things like you will not tolerate rudeness or you will not tolerate talking back or you will not tolerate lateness or you will not tolerate um, lack of work produced. So have a think about what it is that is really important for you to not tolerate. And I would also recommend that that list is not exhaustive. Isolate it to maybe three things. So it makes it really easy in the lesson for you to identify that behavior and say that is something I just do not tolerate whatsoever. The other benefit of making sure that you know very clearly what are these things that you will not tolerate is that it's very easy to communicate that to students and for them to remember it. So it's about choosing these things carefully at the beginning and play that long game so that students can really learn to never display those behaviours. And so it becomes quite automatic and then you're able to shift what those behaviours that you don't tolerate become and you can increase the number of things that you would really appreciate them to develop. My second tip is to make sure that out of every single lesson you have to prep for your week, that the lessons for the classes that you teach that are the most challenging are the lessons you prioritise as your absolute number one. You have to make time to prep and plan these lessons to the best of your ability. It is where most of your effort and time needs to be. It's also because when you end up teaching this lesson that you have spent time prepping and planning and really refining and thinking about how it's going to land in the classroom, how you're going to manage that room, that activity, transition, between activities that students then end up building trust and confidence in your capabilities as a teacher and that's the bit that you have to focus on to get it right over a long period of time is building that trust both ways. Students trusting that you are a really great teacher and that you care to put the time into teaching a really great lesson. And you then also building the trust in students, being able to respond and respect your time when you did plan that lesson. My third tip is to get to know your students really well. Now this can happen by liaising with pastoral teams. This could be head of years, it could be tutors, it could be other subject teachers, or teachers that just know those students really well from extracurricular clubs or having taught them in the past. And it can also be ways of getting to know students from looking at old reports or online portals and platforms where things are documented. And it can also happen organically in the lesson. I also think it's important not only for you to get to know your students well, but for them to also get glimpses into who you are as a person beyond being a teacher. That really helps to build that relationship and that rapport. My fourth tip is to be prepared for most obstacles or challenges that are going to come your way 
and rehearse your response to them. This rehearsal, I think, is really important because it means that when you end up dealing with that particular obstacle that you're expecting to encounter, you don't really have to experience decision fatigue. You know exactly how you're going to respond in that moment and then it's just all about executing it. So I think it's really beneficial for you to have a think about particular things you know you're always going to encounter with a particular student or just a group of students and what is going to be your verbal and non-verbal response and just rehearse that a couple of times. It could be with a teacher friend, could be with your mentor, your line manager, could be by yourself. But I think it's really important to spend some time doing that just to lift a weight off your shoulders and also build a little bit of self-confidence that you can do it. My fifth one is to contact home but when it's right. I think sometimes what happens is when we teach challenging classes it can be a little bit of a cop-out to manage behavior in the classroom and to say oh I'm going to contact home as a bit of a threat and it could also be like dangling a carrot and saying if you get this bit done I will contact home to say how proud and impressed I am with the fact that you got that piece of work done. I think there is a time and place for us to maybe use those strategies but what I mean about contacting home when it is right is about identifying key behaviours that might have happened over two, three lessons or over that half term where you think it's really important to build a relationship with home and some type of rapport so that you can work really well together in achieving the best outcomes for those students. So it's not about a consequence or about a reward, but it's actually about a partnership. Students care really deeply about the relationship that you have with home. So if you're able to build one, that would be incredible. But sometimes it also helps you to understand and appreciate the background and the support network that students have or might not have. And so it gives you an indication of what else you can do to, to best support them. Now, my sixth tip is a really special and important one for me and really guides me in my behavior management style. And it is something called having positive, unconditional regard for your students. Now, what this means is when you're dealing with a particular challenging uh, situation where you are going to have to navigate and manage that really well, it could either be because the student is just not responding or listening to you. It could be because they are defensive and confrontational, is that you have to manage your response to them in that moment and in the future moments when they come back to you in future lessons with complete positivity and in an unconditional way. So it means that you care deeply about them no matter what they do. And so responding to them with this approach means that you are not judgmental, you're not defensive, you're not confrontational, you don't raise your voice and you don't hold grudges or lose your temper. It means that when you respond to them, you do so in a caring, nurturing and supportive way while still being able to be fair, firm and have boundaries. It's making sure that students feel that every lesson is a fresh start and a clean slate. And it's also making students feel that they can really rely upon you and trust you. It's about working hard at being there for them, about making them feel special and cared for. Now, my seventh tip is about how you communicate things. Make sure that it is clear and explicit. Now, this is something that is easier said than done. You might think that you were quite clear and explicit with what you wanted students to do or understand from what you were trying to say, but actually they might completely misinterpret or misunderstand you. And so being incredibly clear, very, very explicit with what you are telling them and what you are asking them to do means that there is no room for misinterpretation. So here's an example. If I were to say to a student, get ready for lesson, because they're just sat at the desk and they're just kind of staring into space or whispering to their partner. What I really mean to say is take your book out of your bag and your pen and write down the date and the title. And so being very clear and very explicit with what it is that I mean about getting ready for lesson, it also then sets the student up for success because I have given them explicit instruction about what I need to see for them to be ready for lesson. And so over time, I can put in cues like, after I've been very clear and explicit saying, 
so that you are ready for lesson and then slowly start to remove that and just say get ready for lesson but it's all about training students to be really understanding of what it is that you mean and that leads me on to my eighth tip which is to repeat 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 you're going to have to think about what is the main message you want to ingrain into students mind about your expectations so that you're able to actually teach a lesson sometimes you might have prepped and planned the most amazing lesson but it just can't land in the room because you don't have students attention or engagement or motivation and so you figuring out what it is that you need to fix the kind of pivotal thing that is going to make the most difference once you figure that out you then have to repeat that message and that expectation to them in so many ways and that can be verbally could be using cues non-verbal could be reminders it could be using other students to tell their peers it could be using contacting home or tutor just reinforcing that message over and over and over again so that you can conquer it in the short term and then definitely in the long term it also really helps students students to build momentum. It helps to make them feel that they are making progress when you have repeated a particular expectation and now four or five lessons in, they've mastered it. It's having those quick wins. So my ninth tip is offering an explanation and a choice of the outcome as a way of de-escalating a potential issue. Now this strategy is an important one to me because it helps me to be fair and consistent but also act with integrity and remain calm in a potentially stressful situation. So for example you might have a student that has turned up late then the way you might address that is by saying you're late or something like you're late to my lesson that's a negative point. And instead, you could say something like, can I speak with you outside, please? And then once you're outside addressing the situation non-confrontationally and saying, you're late to my lesson. This is now a disruption to those that have already started. And it means that you've missed most of the starter questions, which is going to have an impact on the progress that you can make. I really do need you to get to lesson on time, move quickly between lesson changeover and also show respect and value my time so that we can make the most of the lesson and work hard together at getting you to where you want to be. Now, if you're late to my lesson again, you will either need to stay behind and catch up on what you have missed, or I will have to place you into a detention and contact home. And I know that sometimes by offering this type of explanation and a choice of outcome, it can feel quite time consuming and patronizing, but I think similar to what I had said about being really clear and explicit, if you do offer an explanation about the impact and the consequences of a choice that they have made, that explanation, and then in that being able to say, well, inevitably this is now your options as to how you're going to be able to deal with the consequences of this it forces students to build their self-awareness and their ability to reflect and manage their behaviors and actions and it can even be dealing with a student that had been fairly disruptive up until that point and you had already implemented part of the behavior policy and you're now kind of at a crossroads and so with dealing with a student like this, you might want to say something like, you continue to disrupt the lesson by talking and turning around. Now you either stop talking immediately and remain focused on the work so that we can move forward, or you will need to go outside and wait for someone to collect you. What will it be? And so passing that choice over to students so that they can manage those choices, I think is, is really important. So have a think about how you would phrase the choices for the outcome that you want from particular situations, but also reflect on why are you asking them to do something in particular? Because offering that explanation to students can sometimes be really revolutionary in changing the way that they think, behave, and end up acting towards you. And my last tip is about seating plans. I think seating plans can be often so overlooked. I remember one of my first earliest videos I made was about the seating plan. So I'll link it up here in the cards above. But spend a little bit of time um, changing that seating plan and strategically thinking about where you're going to place students so that you can optimise the learning that you can achieve with them. And also consider leaving gaps where you can move students in the lesson to respond to particular needs. Sometimes students have a falling out or sometimes there are students that have prolonged absence or who have fallen ill so won't be in for a few lessons and you want to make sure that someone has a partner to work with. And it can also be as a behaviour management strategy so that you can move a fairly disruptive child 
to that gap that you had already anticipated to leave empty. And I think it's important with seating plans to review it often and keep refining and tweaking it so that students never get too comfortable where they're at. And there you have it. I hope that you have found these strategies useful. Let me know in the comment section down below if you're gonna try any of them, but also I'd be so curious to know what are strategies that work for you when you teach difficult classes. And it goes without saying that these tips can also be used with any class that you teach. And there are so many other things that you could do. But for me, certainly, these are the things that I have found to be the most effective. And often I keep coming back to them when I'm struggling a little bit and it helps me to remind myself of the things that can be the most powerful and impactful. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in another video very soon. Take care. Bye.